السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو لیکچر سکس آف ٹریپل اے اینڈ ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو کور سیکشن بی دیٹ از انڈر پروفیشنل اینڈ ایتھیکل کنسیڈریشنس اینڈ دا ٹاپک از پروفیشنل لائبلٹی بیکاز دا نیکسٹ لیکچر دیٹ از لیکچر سیون از گوئنگ ٹو بی آن کوالٹی مینجمنٹ دیٹ از سیکشن سی آف ٹریپل اے سلیبس سو ہیئر وی آر گوئنگ ٹو فوکس آن واٹ از دا لائبلٹی ٹو دا کلائنٹ ٹو دی تھرڈ پارٹیز restricting the auditor's liability the expectation gap criminal versus civil liability so understand what is the liability to the third parties do audit have any liability to third parties and what are they okay but before that let's understand who is a third party a third party is any person with whom auditor has no contractual relationship there is no contract between among the auditor and the third party but still they will they may be able to sue the auditor for damages okay in the tort of negligence okay this is law this is the uk law we are talking about according to the law in the tort of negligence the plaintiff who is the plaintiff the person who suffers the damage is known as plaintiff okay so the plaintiff in this case the third party because often the third party is the one who is who is uh, filing a case against an auditor so in this case third party is a plaintiff and auditor is known as defendant okay so the plaintiff the third party must prove who has to prove not the auditor that they are uh, they have a liability or not it is the plaintiff the third party has to prove that a number 1 the defendant that is the auditor owes a duty of care to them second defendant that means the auditor has breached that appropriate standard of care third plaintiff that means the the plaintiff that means the third party okay so because of the auditor's incorrect uh, audit report or whatever it is third party has suffered some kind of loss because of the audit auditor's breaching so if this three there is if this three things are proved by the plaintiff auditor is liable to the third party okay critical matter in most negligence cases is what auditor owes a duty of care or not if auditor owes a duty of care to the third party auditor will be liable otherwise auditor will not be liable okay that is the most important thing now we'll ask the three questions when is a duty of care owed how do you know see a duty of care means it exists between a special relationships okay when there is a special relationship between the parties for example auditor knows or auditor is supposed to know okay that someone is going to rely on the audited financial statements and it's not everyone it's some particular person or some particular class of person they are going to rely on the auditor financial statements okay so the injured party must prove that auditor knows or audit at least is about to know that that injured party is going, uh, must have relied on the financial statements second proximity see there should be some proximity the distance how remote how far away or how close they are the injured party should have some sufficient proximity that belongs to a class likely to rely on the financial statements proximity means the distance for example a person in some country i mean uh, overseas is getting injured or suffered financially they have suffered because of your auditor financial statements so Uh, in that condition it's easy to say that auditor will not be liable because uh, they are very remote proximity has to be there with the injured party and the one who are going to rely on the financial statement we have so many cases to show you how it is okay injured party did in fact so reply so the injured party actually uh, relied on the auditor's financial statements injured party must have acted differently if the financial statement showed a different picture so injured party has to prove this not the auditor now has second question is has the auditor exercised uh, due professional care 
if no it is very easy that auditors are liable but what if it's yes okay we have to see some facts so here auditor have exercised professional care if they have done these things number one they have complied with most up-to-date professional standards and ethical standards they have complied with all terms and conditions of appointment that is there in the letter of engagement they have competent staff who are trained who are supervised third question has the injured party suffered a loss so remember those three questions what are the three questions i'll go back first is when is the duty of care owed second is has the auditor exercised professional care and the third is has the injured party suffered a loss this is a fact now for example let's say x company relies on your audited financial statement okay audited financial statements of company a and pays 5 billion to buy that company because of the audited financial statements but later comes to know that company is only worth 1 million in this case there's a loss of 4 million that has occurred so injured party did suffer a loss how do you restrict the auditor's liability auditors cannot have unlimited liability no you have to restrict that how do you do that restrict the use of the auditor's report and the assurance report to their specific intended purpose that means when you are using the auditor's report it should be used for some specific purpose make sure it is for some intended and specific purpose it is not just generally used for any purpose that the user wants restrict the use second engagement letter clause in the engagement letter clause itself there's a clause that says to limit the liability to third party limit liability to third parties you have a liability to third parties but it's limited third screen the client i mean which client are you going to accept which you are not going to accept because especially if the client is high risk you are not going to accept that client otherwise your liability will be unlimited take specialized legal advice wherever is appropriate then because the, obviously the lawyers and all because they will be knowing more about the rules regulations the laws more than the auditor so take their advice restrict uh, respective responsibilities and duties of directors and auditors communicated in engagement letter so that misunderstanding reduces right insurance take professional indemnity insurance what is this professional indemnity insurance we'll see at the uh, towards the end of the video there are two types of insurance okay we'll go through those carry out high quality audit work the moment you carry high quality audit work definitely your liability reduces or why are we doing all this in order to protect auditor okay take on llp st status limited liability limit liability partnership llp stands for that because as an auditor what happens is when one auditor does is negligent the blame comes on all the auditor so in order to protect have llp status limited liability partnership and then set a liability cap with clients that this is your liability limit beyond this you will not be payable to your client we'll go through that at the end what is this limit liability cap so if you just read downwards from r to s the first to the last you can see that i've highlighted the first initial the first letter of each so if you read it it's r e s t r i c t s if you read it it will be restricts it stands for restricts in order for you to remember if you want to right now we are moving on to the expectation gap since there's always an expectation gap user expect something else auditor's responsibilities in fact uh, is something else okay bigger the expectation gap bad it is smaller the expectation gap better it is remember this expectation gap means there's a gap of understanding between public and auditor public believes auditor to do this or that or they at what they actually do there's a difference this can be categorized into two things one is standard and performance gap what does it mean that means users see general common user okay they will not understand all this auditor's responsibility how much are they responsible and up to what limit normal user normal general common public will not understand all this it's you and me we are understanding because we are 
we have done acc you can say so we know but not everyone is in acc qualified no so they will not understand general public they view audit as someone who has so comprehensive understanding they need to perform their uh, they should have very high performance standard right that is the user's understanding of auditor's responsibility so according to the user if things go wrong they think that auditor did not perform their work properly they believe it is the auditor's responsibility to find each and every fraud right next is liability gap liability means to whom the auditor is actually responsible legally responsible user does not have that understanding so this other two types of gap because of this there are issues now how do you bridge that expectation gap how do you uh, narrow that gap there are some ways educate the user educate the user to reduce the standard gap so that they reduce the gap so that they do not expect too much of the auditor example auditors report now includes greater detail of auditors responsibility if you see so that users are more educated and on key audit matters especially second written representation letter from the management which is signed so that it is uh, it can be seen that they are also responsible or managers are also responsible for the financial statements increase the communication between the auditor and those charged with governance regarding their responsibilities increase the scope of the work of the audit because if you increase the scope you will have a, a greater chance of detecting fraud and error okay this are some examples of expectation gap okay like users believe that auditor is responsible for preventing and detecting fraud also but we have earlier seen in this lecture that it's not the previous lecture that is lecture 5 we have seen it is the manager's responsibility to prevent and detect fraud but users believe that it is auditor's responsibility right because users only should have a reasonable expectation of detecting material fraud and error reasonable second example is users believe that they can sue the auditor if company fails but it is the director's responsibility to run their business as a going concern it is not the auditor's responsibility to protect individual shareholders if that individual shareholders make a poor investment decision third example is users believe audit firm will report externally all wrong doing no they cannot show all the wrong doings it's not possible they will only show noclar what is nocl what is it no clear you can say non compliance with legal non compliance with laws and regulations okay so the auditor will only report externally when there is a duty to do so not all the time fourth example is users believe that auditors will highlight the poor performance by the management but it is not their job their job is only to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared on a true and a fairness or not right but even if poor decision has been made but the financial effect of those decision has been properly reflected in the financial statement auditor's report will not mention anything nothing to mention in the auditor's report now we are moving on to the last part of this lecture that is civil and criminal liability there are two types of liability in uk law one is known as civil liability this definitely you must have gone through in your f4 law business law right we are not going in detail we are only looking it from the point of auditor that's it small part of it we are touching one is known as criminal liability or the other one is known as civil liability first understand what is civil liability which is that third party is suffering loss because they are relying on a negligently prepared auditor's report 
okay under this conditions there will be civil liability second is according to insolvency legislation to creditor here auditors must be careful that no loss i mean creditors should not be suffering loss just like how they protect directors they you should not cause loss to the creditors alongside the directors auditors very should be very careful in that otherwise civil liability third under tax legislation okay especially when the auditors are aware of tax fraud done by the client then under finance service a uh, financial service legislation to the investor and then under stock exchange legislation and rules so under all this five you will be facing civil liability civil liability means you just have to pay for the damages that is the only civil offense now we are moving on to the criminal side these are the examples of criminal liability when you are acting as an auditor when you are not supposed to because you are ineligible second you are into fraud theft bribery forms of corruption falsifying accounting records misleading matters in an auditor's report insider dealing you are involved in insider dealing you are knowingly or recklessly making false statement so the penalties for the criminal liability could be fine or also even more serious imprisonment you might be sent to prison or sometimes you might be uh, disqualified by your profession by your body professional body for example acc here to add as an auditor you might be removed your membership you might be removed from the membership if you are in any of this activity now let's go through a case study to understand this better the lawyer versus little john case so according to this case okay little john de paula who is he he's the auditor the auditor has successfully defended themselves against this negligence claim case how did they do that number one they have showed that they follow the standard that is expected of a normal auditor that means they have performed all the audit work according to auditing standard second their their working papers were good enough to show consideration of the problem that were raised by the plaintiff that is the client and also they have made reasonable decisions after the consideration and the third plaintiff had not made all the reasonable inquiries when they were purchasing a company rather they didn't even review the business that were needed they did it only after the purchase plaintiff is the lawyer plaintiff is the client so in this case what happened what did the court ruled out the court the court the judge said that the cost will be for the plaintiff to bear not the defendant so, so, yeah for the plaintiff to bear not the defendant defendant is the auditor in this case so auditor is protected auditor won the case and the cost fell on the defendant sorry the plaintiff the client lawyer because they were the one who didn't do reasonable inquiries of the business in fact auditor has taken care of the standard they have their working papers that, that were good they proved that plaintiff did not do reasonable inquiries so auditor won the case likewise there are so many other examples which you can read in your textbook i have not included all the case study just one now methods of limiting audit liability how do you limit there are three methods first one is liability cap i told you liability cap could be fixed that means you are putting a fixed limit that this is your liability beyond this you don't have to you are not liable this is mostly practiced in germany or if you are going by uk 
or US, you can put a multiple of the audit fee. But remember, it has a downside. What is it? If you're putting a multiple of the audit fee, you might sometimes say, okay, lower the fee. Lower the fee means quality also will be low. Okay. Why do you say that to lower the fee? Lower the fee means your liability you are reducing. You are going to say that if you are going to pay me low fee, I will be less liable. So that's how you can reduce it. But quality will suffer. Second is compulsory insurance for director. Where both auditor and director could have insurance. And they both could be responsible for it partially according to their share of cost. Third method is modification of the joint and the several liability principle. Earlier we said all auditors are jointly responsible. But let's modify that a bit. Okay. Auditors are jointly and severely liable with directors where negligence claims are made. Okay, they say that it's just not the director. Auditors are also partly responsible for a negligence claim because why? They fail to detect. They fail to detect. And why do they do this? The reason is objective of this is to protect the plaintiff who has suffered a loss so that they get the maximum of their loss. They are able to recover the maximum of the losses that they have incurred. The reason is that to protect the plaintiff. Otherwise, what happens? Auditors can just quickly walk away with it by protecting themselves by the limited liability status. So they are making the auditors also responsible now, alongside the director with for a negligence claim. Okay. But there's a problem here. Problem is what? Problem was that all partners and directors are responsible for the misconduct of other partner and the other director in the audit firm. They don't care which audit was which auditor was involved in that. Even if you as an auditor were not involved, if your partner did something, you will be equally responsible for it. Okay. Both in UK and US is has faced this problem, are facing this problem, but this problem is partly dealt now by having this LLP status that is limited liability partnership. Now the audit firm will be limited liability partnership. They'll be having limited liability. Not all the partners will be responsible for the audit partners. Then, as I told you in the beginning of this lecture, there are two types of insurance. You can limit by having insurance for accountancy firm. Okay. See, one of the obligations of PA, what is PA, public accountant? In the public practice is to ensure that if there is any negligence that has been caused to a client, they have an, they should have an insurance policy so that they can pay any damages to that insurance. There are two types of insurance. One is known as PII, which stands for Professional Indemnity Insurance. What does it mean? This insurance is against any claim that is made by the client. That means client is making an insurance, uh, sorry, claim against the auditor. Okay, that means they have relied on the work of the public accountant. Now they are making a claim. Which is very common. Second type of insurance is known as FGI, which stands for Fidelity Guarantee Insurance. This insurance is, okay, against any liability that is arising through acts of fraud or dishonesty by any partner or employee of the audit. Okay. You don't have to know so much of detail, just knowing the difference between this two is enough. Now we are moving on to what is known as disclaimer statement. This also can be used to limit your liability disclaimer Disclaimer of opinion. I mean disclaimer statement. Okay, let's go through this. According to ICAEW, okay, ICAEW members, they recommend that you use these additional wordings in the auditor's report so that liabilities are reduced. Let's read. It is in bracket. I mean it's given in the this thing. Let's read what they have written in the report. 
this report is paid solely to the company members as a body our audit has been carried out so that we might state to the company members those matters which are required to state them in an auditor's report for no other purpose we do not accept responsibility to any one other than the company and the company members as a body for audit work or for the opinions we have formed but remember acca does not encourage it acca members they discourage the standard disclaimer clauses like this why because they feel it will devalue the auditor's report but they say it can be used in some exceptional cases like for example you know the bank okay if you are not auditing okay so the, you know the bank is going to rely on your audited financial statements auditor is known so in that case you can give them a disclaimer of opinion i mean sorry standard disclaimer clause not a disclaimer of opinion i'm sorry uh, then it becomes an audit opinion sorry standard disclaimer clause because you know bank is going to rely on you so before that only give them a standard disclaimer clause those condition but not on all the conditions because acca believes if the auditor work is performed nicely they have performed their work well then you don't have to protect uh, the auditor's liability through a standard disclaimer clause that's what acca believes but the reason i have included this here is just to show an example how the statement looks like and that acca does not encourage it now you can also do settlement out of code the last step where the plaintiff and the defendant the client and the auditor decides that they are going to settle this out of code what are the benefits of it low cost time saving and less risk of damage to the reputation also but there are drawbacks to it drawbacks as it does not address the importance of practitioners legal responsibilities second there might be pressure maybe it might be due to pressure from insurance insurers who are not willing to risk a code settlement and the third is insurance premiums may still rise you see so that's it for this lecture now this is your homework which i have given it to you these are the three case studies that is given in your kaplan textbook in chapter 4 towards the end of the textbook before test understanding questions under further reading it's given here further reading means you have to read it okay if you do not read it also there is no harm but reading it will give you an additional knowledge of how a case study looks like if they fight and why an auditor or under which conditions an auditor is likely to win the case or the client the plaintiff is likely to win the case you can see something real life examples are given okay these are the three case studies i would recommend you to go and read it i have not included in my text i mean my lecture i have only went through one case study i think where the auditor won the case because they have defended themselves the case studies are banham and capro and atd limited versus bdo binder hindland okay so let's summarize what we have discussed in this lecture we have told that liability to client auditors are liable to client because of the contract they have a contract contractual relationship second liability to third parties not always they are liable to third parties but there are some conditions if they owe a duty of care if duty of care is breached and if loss is suffered because of that breach by their auditor then you are liable to the third party if the answer to all this are no 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 auditor is not liable as simple as that then there were steps to minimize those liability claims how liability cap take insurance disclaimer of uh, disclaimer clause was there which is not encouraged by acca but again and then what was it so this are some steps that you can use to minimize the liability claims take llp status right so that's it for this lecture thank you for watching and see you in the next lecture with a new section that is quality management we are going to start section c from lecture 7 onwards see you take care and don't forget to subscribe if you have not subscribed to my channel